Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I am Robin Brumble, a registered nurse and Cielo Society's Director of Scientific Affairs and Research. At CLL Society, we are dedicated to bringing credible and up-to-date information to the CLL and SLL community because we believe smart patients get smart care. As a reminder, you can re-watch all of our educational programs by going to the section of our website called Education On Demand. This program was made possible through support from both our donors and our industry partners. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm Stephen Feldman. I am a CLL patient presently in my sixth year of remission following frontline treatment. I am a longtime CLL patient advocate, member of CLL Society's Patient Advisory Board, a senior support group advisor, as well as co-facilitator of the City of Hope CLL Society Support Group. I would like to welcome everyone joining us for today's event. We will be joined by Dr. Joanna Rhodes, director of the CLL Research and Treatment Center at Northwell Health in New York. Dr. Rhodes will be covering important aspects of the early journey with CLL SLL, including diagnosis, testing, symptoms, our immunocompromised status, vaccinations, and secondary cancer screenings. She will also discuss when to start treatment and the importance of maintaining health and wellness. We will be answering audience questions at the end of this event, so please take advantage of this opportunity and ask your questions in the Q&A box. Before we invite Dr. Rhodes, I want to briefly share a few resources from the CLL Society. CLL Society's motto is smart patients get smart care. In this brief presentation, I will show you a few resources that can help you become a smart patient and to better advocate for your best possible care. The early part of your CLL journey is the ideal time to begin learning about the disease, finding resources, experts, and support. The slides from today's presentation will be available for you to review. They contain hyperlinks to the resources that I will be highlighting. The online patient education toolkit is a great way to learn a broad spectrum of information, including the basic biology of the disease, treatment options, and other important resources. Each topic is presented in patient-friendly terms. Another great resource that the CLL Society provides is the Normal Labs value chart and the tracker, which you can download and use to record your routine blood test results. In CLL, it's often not one lab report that tells the story, but whether levels are trending up or down over time, that can inform your questions and decision-making. It is more likely that you will be seen by different providers over time and have blood work performed at different labs. The lab tracker then becomes an important resource where you can have the history of your results entered and displayed in a single document. You can take this tracker with you to medical appointments if meeting with a new doctor or to better informed discussions with your healthcare providers. It is valuable to have predictive cytogenetic testing done at the time of diagnosis. Importantly, it's critical, underline critical, to get cytogenetic predictive testing prior to the first and every subsequent treatment. CLL Society's Test Before Treatment campaign highlights the three cytogenetic tests that are essential prior to treatment. These include FISH, IGVH and TP53. To support patients and caregivers, there is a downloadable one page sheet available on our website. It is recommended that you bring the test before treat document with you to your medical appointments to help inform this discussion. Putting together your team early on in your journey is important to have a support system in place. The world expert is a doctor who lives and breathes CLL, who will direct your overall strategy and who has access to the latest therapies and clinical trials. You may not see this doctor often, but they are accessible for important conversations. The local expert is your local oncology or hematology doctor. CLL patients are at a higher risk for second cancers, 
especially skin cancer. So your other healthcare team should be in place too, including your dermatologists and primary care doctors. A financial navigator can include a financial counselor or social worker. This could also be a close family member or friend who is willing to help. Personal support can come in many forms and there are numerous benefits to joining a CLL specific support group that I will share later on. Download CLL Society's helpful list and put your team together. If you do not have a CLL world expert on your team and you have questions about symptoms, treatment or when to treat, there is CLL Society's expert access program. This program is free of charge and provides a HIPAA compliant second opinion consultation with a CLL expert physician. Afterwards, you will be provided with a written report that you can bring with you to your local treatment team. This program is in place for patients when they are unsure of their disease status or their treatment plan and need a second opinion from a CLL world expert. Often, the best advice comes from the hard-earned wisdom and emotional balance that can only be offered by fellow CLL patients and caregivers who have already experienced the challenges you are facing or the therapy you may be considering. CLL Society support groups are an important resource for education and emotional support. For those who watch and wait, there is great benefit for attending support groups with people who have a range of treatment experience for their CLL or SLL. Not more than a few members in my own group have expressed that the information and resources they discovered from participating literally, literally saved their lives. In addition to joining a local support group, CLL Society has recently launched three watch and wait specific support groups which meet every other month. All support groups are currently meeting virtually through Zoom. The best way to stay informed about breaking research, news, education, and events is through signing up for CLL Society's This Week email newsletter. Check out the What's New page on our website to find the latest information. You can find CLL Society on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. CLL Society is a nonprofit organization, and we couldn't do our work without you. Please help provide support and education for those impacted by CLL and SLL by donating to CLL Society. Use this time in the early stage of your journey to get educated about CLL and SLL and become a self-advocate in your health care. CLL Society provides many tools and medically curated information to support you. Put together a team and include a CLL expert physician. Stay informed with what's new through the weekly email and continue to join us for these important webinars. Without further ado, we welcome Dr. Joanna Rhodes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Joanna Rhodes, and I'm the director of the CLL program at the Northwell Health Cancer Institute. Uh, today, I'm here to talk with you about the importance of front-loading your knowledge during the early journey of CLL and SLL. So first, I thought we would start off with a little bit of just background on CLL. Uh, so we know that the median age of diagnosis for patients with CLL is 70 years of age, and there are about 20,000 new cases a year. Uh, and it's not the most common cause of death in cancers. When we look at SEER data, about 7% of only about 4,400 uh, cases per year. Uh, CLL, again, is the most common leukemia in the Western hemisphere and makes up 25% of diagnoses. It is more common in men and more common in Caucasians. And something that we'll get into a little bit later in the discussion is that approximately a third of patients never need treatment. So really, what is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and small lymphocytic lymphoma? So when we use the term CLL, we are really referring to the blood and bone marrow. So finding these abnormal cells in those compartments. 
And when we talk about SLL or small lymphocytic lymphoma, we're really talking about patients that have these abnormal cells in their lymph nodes or in their spleen. But for all intensive purposes, these are the exact same disease. And so really, while we call CLL a leukemia, I don't think of it as a leukemia. I think of it really as a lymphoma, where we see the cell circulating in, the, in your blood. And when you look at the WHO, which is sort of one of our big uh, organizations that tells us a lot about the path pathology and how we categorize diseases, what we can see is that they actually do put these two diseases together, which I think is important um, because sometimes you can see different information for CLL and SLL, but in reality, they are really continuums of the same disease. So how do we make a diagnosis of CLL? So when we're looking at patients with blood at CLL, we're looking for at least 5,000 monoclonal B cells in the peripheral blood. And we usually, and in order to maintain a diagnosis of CLL, we should be seeing those cells over the course of three, over at least three months. I think it's important to note that patients may or may not be symptomatic. And really what we're looking for is this monoclon monoclonality, as, which means that all of these cells are coming from one specific cell. So they all look the same when we do something called flow cytometry, they're all kind of looked together and there are just two more of them than we would expect to see. And then we're also looking for a specific, what we call immunophenotype. And what that basically means is that we're looking for specific markers on the outside of these, of these lymphocytes, these CLL cells, to look to see if it really is diagnostic of CLL. When we think about this as well, you know, we're looking at whether or not this is more of a leukemia, meaning that we're seeing really mostly just the cells in the peripheral blood, or perhaps more of the lymphoma, where we're really seeing in large lymph nodes and large spleen. And that really, the, when we're looking mostly at in large lymph nodes and in large spleens, that's really where we're getting into small lymphocytic lymphoma, the diagnosis of small lymphocytic lymphoma. So again, in that scenario, we can see some circulating cells in the peripheral blood, but the majority of our patients that with SLL are actually diagnosed on a lymph node biopsy, meaning that somebody saw an enlarged lymph node and did some special testing to look to see why that lymph node was enlarged. Um, you can still get signs of CLL with SLL, which is why we can kind of see on here, this is sort of a continuum, right? So you can kind of go back and forth. One of the other things that you may see in your reading, or we may talk a little bit about is something called monoclonal B lymphocytosis. Monoclonal B lymphocytosis is basically, is often found in patients that do have an elevated lymphocyte count, meaning that their doctors looked at their CBC and saw that something called the absolute lymphocyte count was elevated and sent them to a hematologist for further workup. And when we do this monoclonal, mono, looking for monoclonality and immunophenotyping, we do find that there are these cells that have this same or similar markings on the outside to patients that have chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But as you can see here, really those, the patients with monoclonal B lymphocytosis have less of those cells circulating, meaning that they have less than 5,000 cells circulating in their peripheral blood. And they also often have no symptoms. There's no enlarged lymph nodes. Their spleen is not enlarged. And this is really sort of a precursor state and around one to two patients per year who have MBL can actually develop CLL. Now, if you have MBL and you transition to CLL, that doesn't necessarily change your treatment plan. And it's something to talk with your doctor about specifically, but it does sort of change the diagnosis. Um, really monoclonal B lymphocytosis is probably underdiagnosed in the population just because when we see these abnormalities, sometimes they don't ring a red flag um, as something that needs to be worked up. And often we can, it's attributed to something reactive, meaning that your lymphocyte count is elevated in the setting of something else going on. So again, just to reconfirm, so the diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia is the median age of diagnosis is at 70 years of age. 
We have a male to female ratio again of two to one. So more common in males. And then again, the diagnosis is made by flow cytometry, looking for a very specific immunophenotype, like we saw on the last slide. Um, on the right, we have what is called a peripheral blood smear. So basically what we do is we take a drop of your blood, we put it on a slide, and then we look at it underneath the microscope to look to see what the cells actually look like. Characteristically, the CLL, we see uh, more lymphocytes than we would previously. And when we sort of do the actual smear, these lymphocytes, these CLL cells are so fragile that they actually get spread and they smudge. And so this is what we call a smudge cell. So these are actually CLL cells. Some of these other ones are CLL cells too. But this is something that really is characteristic when we look at the peripheral blood for CLL. So I think one of the most important things for CLL patients is feeling informed so that way you can advocate for your own care. And so one of the big questions that always comes up is, well, what test should my doctor be doing? Uh, so the most important thing, of course, are blood counts. And then physical examinations are really important to look for, lymph, for enlarged lymph nodes and enlarged spleen. Um, People often ask about bone marrow biopsies. Now, I don't think that every patient needs a bone marrow biopsy with CLL, and that's because we can find a lot of the information that we need just from doing blood tests from the peripheral blood. Um, there are occasions where we would need a bone marrow biopsy, but again, that's sort of case by case and something to discuss with your doctor specifically. Um, the flow cytometry is one of the most important things that your doctor will do. And that's really how we make the diagnosis of CLL. Again, it's looking for that monoclonality and looking for that immunophenotype. And the flow cytometry gives us that information. Quantitative immunoglobulin test is important because CLL, CLL, patients with CLL are at higher risk for infections. And over time, patients can develop something called hypogamma globulinemia, which is a huge word that basically means that over time, you're not, your antibody levels, sort of the normal circulating antibodies that we have that protect us from infections get, can get low over time or perhaps low at the time of diagnosis. I think it's important to, to think about that because if you're having more frequent infections, it's something that you should talk with your doctor about. And we'll again, get into this a little bit later too. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these specialized tests that tell what I, I sort of say to my patients, tell me a little bit about the flavor of your CLL. Tell me a little bit about how it might behave. Some of these genetic tests, things like fluorescence in situ hybridization or fish testing karyotyping, which basically means looking at all of your chromosomes underneath a microscope, DNA sequencing, which basically means looking at looking for specific mutations within your DNA um, and how that relates to your CLL, a, a, a lab called beta-2 microglobulin, a lab called lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. Both of those are important because they've been historically used as markers for how active your CLL may be, although those markers in and of themselves are not necessarily going to tell us what, if and when you need treatment. And then, of course, hepatitis B testing is very important. Um, many of our medications that we give are immunosuppressive. And so if you have ever been exposed to hepatitis B, it is important for us to know that. So that way we can put you on antiviral medications to prevent the hepatitis B from coming back. So again, fish testing is fluor fluorescence in situ hybridization. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at the chromosomes and we're looking for some very specific abnormalities. The most important of which is something called deletion 17P, where we're looking to see, these are your two chromosomes here. You have one on the, on the left, which has both parts, and one on the right. The big one is Q and the small little one is P. And as we can see here, we're missing one P, uh, one 17P. That's important because it lets us, it gives us an idea of how your CLL might behave and how it might respond to certain treatments. Mutation analysis is also important. So we can do genetic sequencing to look at several different genes. 
Um, one of the most important genes is something called TP53. Um, and again, that gives us a little bit of an idea of how your CLL may behave whether and whether or not certain drugs may work better versus others. And finally, mutations in something called the immunoglobulin heavy chain disease or IGHV you may have read about. Um, this is an important one as well, because again, it does tell us a little bit about the behavior of your CLL. Um, it's definitely important for, has some treatment implications, but perhaps a little bit less important than it was previously. So why did we figure out that these things were important? So genetics, we know from very old data. So again, this is from, I'm going to highlight this. This was a paper that was published in the year 2000. So really this is data from the 1990s and it is uh, 2023. So this is, you know, pretty old data. Um, but what they showed was that in patients with CLL that were treated with chemotherapy, these different genetic abnormalities actually told us how well they would respond um, with patients with deletion 17P having the poorest responses to chemotherapy. Now we don't use chemotherapy for patients with deletion 17P, and this is actually one of the reasons why, but I think it's important to kind of get the historical picture of why on earth are all of my doctors talking about all of these different genetic tests. This is really where that information comes from. And some of it is still important. Some of it may be a little bit less important as our treatments have gotten better over time. But this is why when you look at your FISH report, you may read different things about things being favorable versus unfavorable. I wouldn't take too, put too much, uh, great. I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that because again, I think that the field is changing. And again, most of this data really is from when we were using chemotherapy and, and we're really using less chemotherapy now. And very similarly, this was the data for the IGHV mutation, which I think every, every patient with CLL should be tested for at the time of diagnosis. Um, again, showing that patients that are unmutated don't respond as well to chemotherapy um, and in that, set, in that scenario of not having the best treatments available had shorter survival. Now, again, this is data, again, look, that was, that this was published in 1999. So this is in the 90s. Um, and our treatments have improved. So I think that this data may change over time now that we have better understanding. But again, I think it's important to understand the historical context of why these things are important and why we want to order them. So what are the symptoms of CLL? So over time, you may develop fatigue. Some people can develop some shortness of breath that could be related to a low red blood cell count or something called anemia. Over time, if your lymph nodes are enlarged, they can get bigger and sometimes become painful. Your spleen is, is for all intensive purposes, basically like a giant lymph node. Um, and that can get bigger over time and can cause you to have weight loss because you're not eating as well or you feel full early. Uh, some patients with CLL can start to get frequent infections, the most common of which are viral upper respiratory tract infections and pneumonias. And some people can develop night sweats as well. So sort of at night, you're getting very hot and sweaty, needing to change the pillowcase, change your t-shirt. Um, but I would say the majority of patients when they're diagnosed have no symptoms at all. So these are really things that can develop over time. Another question that I think is important as we talk about uh, patients with CLL getting infections is, am I immunocompromised? And so, I think that this is a challenging question because it's different for different patients. And I do think it's a continuum. Um, we know that CLL is a cancer of the immune system. So it's a cancer of, B of something called B cells and B cells job ultimately is to make antibodies. I think we think about this a lot more now that now that we talked about COVID vaccines and people talk about checking for antibodies for COVID, but really that's what a B cells job is over time. Um, because it is a cancer of B cells, it does put patients at higher risk for infections. Um, and again, the CLL may make it harder for your immune system to make antibodies, even to the, no even to the normal infections that you may get like a common cold. And because of that, it may take you longer to clear a cold or any type of viral infection. This is sort of a, the, the, uh, in 
the immunodeficiency in CLL is actually a little bit more complicated than it just being a cancer of B cells. And that we have two different sort of, we have two different cells that are really important in our immune system. We have our B cells for making antibodies, but we also have our T cells. And the way that I think about this is that if you think of the immune system, sort of like the department of defense, everybody has different jobs. And so your beast and you have sort of your infantry, which are like your neutrophils, which are sort of very nonspecific. They go, they're on the front lines fighting infections. You have your B cells, which I think more like the special forces. They're a little bit more specialized um, and get a little bit more training to do specific things. And then you have your T cells. So there are fewer T cells than there are B cells and they're your generals. They're kind of the ones that are running the show, taking the lay of the land and telling the different cells where to go and when. And in CLL, our T cells also don't function as function normally. They have what we call an exhaustive phenotype. So they're kind of sleeping on the job a little bit. And so you kind of get this immunocompromise from both of these things. And that's what makes it a little bit challenging to try and fix the immune system for someone with CLL. I think the most important thing when you're thinking about am I immunocompromised is having a very clear conversation with your physician about what that means for you in terms of your own infection risk. So this is adapted, for, adapted from a beautiful article that was written a while ago, but I think it's still quite pertinent. Um, how do we you know, initially assess patients with CLL and how do we support you in this new diagnosis? And there are lots of different ways. So a new patient with diag newly diagnosed CLL needs risk stratification and counseling on what this all means. Very important to maintain healthcare maintenance and health screening. And then the other portion is how do we prevent infections in patients with CLL, as we just talked about the fact that patients are immunocompromised, so maybe a little bit more likely to get infections. So when we think about risk stratification and counseling, I'm often thinking about different things, th thinking about what CLL means for the person sitting in front of me and how their age, their sex, their race, and their comorbid medical conditions may impact one, how frequently I see them in the clinic, as well as two, if we get to a point where we need treatment, what those treatment options may be. And again, in terms of thinking about health screening, so this is very important. So one of the risks with CLL is that patients can get other types of cancers. And that probably has to do with the underlying immune dysfunction that we talked about with the B cells and the T cells. Um, so it's very important for patients to get an annual skin exam because the most common thing that patients can get are non-melanoma skin cancers, things like basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. And then it's super important to make sure that you're staying up to date on your age appropriate cancer screening. Colonoscopy, I recommend that all of my patients, male patients get a PSA checked. Our women should all stay up to date on their mammograms as well as pap smears. Um, and then we should also be checking for vitamin D deficiency. The vitamin D question, the pendulum swing both ways, but in this early portion when perhaps you're not on treatment, I think making sure that your vitamin D replete uh, is important. And finally, when we think about infection prevention and vaccination, you know, we are thinking about how do we prevent you from getting infections and, and keep you out of the hospital with infections? That's the way I really look at it. Uh, and so I do recommend that patients get the influenza vaccine yearly. I think all patients, regardless of age, should get the pneumonia vaccine series. That vaccine series is going to look a little bit different depending on if you've been vaccinated previously or not. So I would discuss that with your doctor because there's different vaccination uh, combinations and sequences depending on whether or not you've gotten uh, PCV13, PCV15, PCV20 is the newest one that was just approved in the last year. So these are all important things to talk about with your physician. Um, I do recommend that patients get a Tdap uh, every 10 years. Um, I think all patients should get the Shingrix vaccine series uh, to prevent shingles. Uh, we do avoid live vaccines in patients with CLL because there is a risk that you could actually get the infection that we're trying to prevent. And so for that reason, the Shingrix vaccine is safe, but Zostavax is not. 
SOSVETS also doesn't work very well and Shingrix is actually much better when you look at efficacy. Um, so I do recommend all of my patients get that vaccine series. Additionally, we do recommend that patients get the COVID-19 vaccine series with boosters. Uh, currently, that means that patients should get the two vaccine series followed by a regular booster and then also get the bivalent booster as well. The CDC has not recommended any further boosters, but I imagine that there will be more to come uh, in terms of guidance for COVID-19. Um, and then again, we talked a little bit about checking your immunoglobulin levels. So that's something called IgG, which you can see here. If your IgG level is low and you've been having a lot of infections, we can actually give you other people's immunoglobulins to try and help prevent infections. That doesn't change your CLL. It won't prevent the CLL from perhaps requiring treatment in the future, but we do know that it does decrease the risk of hospitalizations as well as the number of infections that people get yearly. Um, and this is something I do very frequently in my own clinical practice and is something that if you're noticing a lot of infections, you should discuss with your doctor. So I think the, the hard challenge is a lot of patients with CLL are diagnosed. And at first you may not need treatment. Some may be diagnosed near the time that they need treatment and get treated very quickly. Some patients, about a third, are going to be on what we call active surveillance, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and may go on to progress to treatment. And about a third of patients actually never need treatment for their CLL. Uh, and really, I think while we, may, while we may be watching you, the majority of patients will require treatment at some point. How many lines of treatment and what those treatments are will depend on conversations with your doctor and the available treatments or clinical trials at the time that you need to start therapy. Um, I think one of the challenging questions that comes up very frequently in clinical practice is, well, you just told me I have leukemia, why are we not doing treatment? Isn't this an emergency? And we really have no data currently to support treatment at diagnosis for patients that do not have symptoms or who do not meet sort of our criteria that we know in order to start treatment. So I think that that's an important thing to remember. The way that I look at it is that there's like a couple, and we'll talk a little bit about this, of why not needing treatment up front is really uh, a, an excellent thing, I think. So I just use this term active surveillance. So what does this mean and what does it look like? So people call this watchful waiting. I don't love that term. Um, I feel like it means like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And in reality, I just don't think that that is what a diagnosis of CLL or its treatment really looks like. I think, and I also think that we actually do a lot of things at visits while you're not on treatment. Um, but active surveillance basically means that we aren't doing active treatment, but you are seeing your doctor at a free, at a specific interval. We're doing blood work and we're doing an examination to look at your lymph nodes and spleen size. And at that visit, it's super important for us to discuss any new symptoms that you have. That way we can determine whether it's related to CLL or unrelated to CLL. And then also, I think it's a good time for us to remind you time to get your mammogram. Are you getting your colonoscopy? Have you had your PSA checked this year? Did you go to the dermatologist and where are we with doing all your vaccinations? So those are the things that I think are super important to talk about at each visit. Um, and then I think oftentimes these visits in my mind are a way for me to get to know you. Um, tell me about your family, your work, the things that you like to do. So that way when we build it's part of sort of building a therapeutic relationship with your doctor. So that way, if, you know, if, and when you do need treatment, you feel comfortable with the person who is taking care of you. So what are the indications for treatment? We've talked a little bit about this. So we think about this in terms of disease symptoms. So fatigue, you know, that's really impairing your daily activities the night sweats we talked about, sweating to the point where you need to change your t-shirt or the bed sheets or the pillowcase, any weight loss that might be related either to the CLL or to not eating well, um, because perhaps your spleen is enlarged and you can't eat the same way that you used to. And really the most important thing is, is this affecting your quality of life? The next thing we look for are low blood counts. So platelets, which are responsible for blood clotting, uh, less than 100, hemoglobin less than 11, 
or perhaps you have a history of autoimmune complications from CLL, something like autoimmune hemolytic anemia or something called idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura or ITP. You know, maybe we've tried some treatments for those and they're not working very well. So maybe then we'll want to treat your CLL. And then we think about it as bulky disease. So you have lymph nodes that are enlarged. You have an enlarged spleen. You have a rapid white blood cell count doubling over time. This one I think is a little bit, uh, we can see the white blood cell count double, but I think it is important to note that there's no magic white blood, th white blood cell count threshold um, in our, our indications. So the IWCLL, which is, makes all of our guidelines that tell us when it's time to treat. And I think that that can be hard because if you have watched your white blood cell count go up over and over the years, it can be very anxiety provoking. Uh, but it's as long as you're not having symptoms from it, it, it can be reasonable to just monitor. Um, again, and that's a conversation to have with your physician specifically. So I think the other question that comes up often and the thing that I notice most in, in many of my patients is that there is a lot of anxiety that goes around active surveillance. You came to our office, we told you you have a leukemia and now we're gonna tell you to sit tight and we'll just see you every three to six months. That, that's a very anxiety provoking conversation. Um, so how do you manage that? So I think support groups are very important. Um, the CLL Society has many, there are some many other resources out there as well. I think that this is a time where really vaccinations and routine healthcare maintenance are very important. Uh, vaccines we know are important in CLL patients, but like we talked about, the immune system responses in CLL patients are perhaps not as robust as in someone that doesn't have CLL. So doing all of your vaccines early, I think protects you the best long-term and protecting you from infections even before you need treatment, I think is of the utmost importance for our patients. And then finally doing things like this, where you're educating yourself about CLL and, and what that means and the tests we do and treatments are very important. Uh, and I think I wanted to highlight that there are a lot of webinars on the CLL Society website there is one um, called A Psychological Perspective of Dealing with the CLL Emotional Roller Coaster that's found on Education on Demand. And I do think it would be a, a great resource for you if you are having a lot of anxiety about your CLL diagnosis, as many of our patients do. So I actually think that there are a lot of benefits to active surveillance. And so what are those benefits? So Many patients come to our office and this was found by their primary care doctor or on a routine physical exam or is found prior to needing a knee replacement or having a surgery. And my hope is that at that time, your quality of life was quite good. And so if, if we tell you you have CLL and that you don't need to do treatment right now, we're actually maintaining your current quality of life um, from a physical standpoint. I think also, when we aren't giving treatment, right, we are avoiding treatment side effects. So what I always, when patients ask about treatment side effects, unfortunately, our drugs are much better and our treatments are much better, but there are still, every time we give you any type of drug, whether it's Tylenol or Ad or an aspirin, there are always potential side effects from those, even if they're very common and very safe drugs. And so by not needing to do treatment up front, we are actually sparing you from these side effects and potential complications from treatment. Um, I call this sort of the period where we can call it betting on the future. So 10 years ago, you know, most patients were getting chemotherapy. And now in the last 10 years with all of the research that's been done, all of the clinical trials, we now have much better drugs that are better targeted towards the pathways of how CLL cells are made and how they survive. And I think that, and every time I have a patient who asks, well, what, what are my treatment options? If I'm seeing you, and I don't know if you're gonna need treatment in the next year, I actually don't know what your treatment option is gonna look like in five years or 10 years, because we're doing so much amazing research. And I do think that we get, you get to kind of what I call bet on the future, meaning that over, by the time you need treatment, we will have much more knowledge then than we do now. Um, and that I think is, that's really powerful and important. 
And finally, this gives you time to build a care team. Uh, so you may be seeing a, a hematologist that's perhaps not who does not specialize only in CLL. So it gives you time to perhaps meet a CLL as someone who does specialize in CLL to find your support groups, to make sure that you have sort of your village to help you get the care that you need and the support that you need during this time. So what else should I be doing for my health? Uh, so again, we talked about routine healthcare maintenance, uh, smoking cessation or eliminating tobacco from, from your da daily life, I think is important just for any risks of cancer and uh, cardiovascular side effects and lung toxicities. We get asked a lot about diet. There is not one specific diet, um, but maintaining a, a healthy diet and maintaining your weight, I think is important. Incorporating physical activity into your daily routine is also important, as well as managing stress and prioritizing sleep. Um, again, there's another CLL Society webinar that I think is really excellent and dives much, much deeper into this than I'm able to in this short period of time called Health and Wellness Beyond the Medicine Cabinet. And I do encourage everyone to listen to this one because it is incredible. There's some incredible research that's being done in diet and exercise for patients with CLL. So what should I expect when I need treatment? So at the time that you need treatment, I do think it's important to ask if your doctor has repeated all of these special tests, these genetic tests. So the fish tests, the karyotype, looking for new mutations using what we call next generation sequencing or NGS. And then I think the other question is whether or not you should receive standard of care treatments. And there are many, many right now, it's sort of a little bit of an alphabet soup, um, or if you would be a candidate for a clinical trial. Um, again, I think clinical trials are excellent for, pati for patients, but something to always ask your doctors about. And then always asking about what the risks and benefits are of the different treatment options, because I think you'll still, I think the way that CLL is moving and the research that the field is moving into, there will always be options. So there won't just be one thing that we give to everyone. Um, and finally, right now we have therapies that are time limited. So are given over a fixed duration um, or therapies that you take very similarly to like a blood pressure medication where you take it for as long as it's working. So in summary, because CLL and SLL is often a slow moving disease, treatment is not needed for mo many patients at the time of diagnosis. And this gives it time to, gives you time to gain the knowledge that you need to feel comfortable with the understanding of your disease, gather your resources so that you feel that you know where to go to if you have questions kind of plan out your journey a little bit. So what does care look like for you? And what are the pieces that need to be in place for you to feel well cared for? And then again, build your team for a healthy long life. Uh, and so in, in general, smart patients get smart care, which is the slogan of the CLL Society. And I think that that is super important, particularly when you are first diagnosed. Thank you so much for your attention. And I look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes, for that very helpful and information-packed presentation. Okay, we're going to begin the question and answer portion of today's presentation. Uh, we will try to get to as many audience questions as possible, uh, but if we're not able to get to your question for any reason, please send it to our Ask the Expert email address after the event. The email address will appear on our closing slide. So let me move over to our questions. And I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, what are the essential questions that newly diagnosed patients should ask their oncologist? That's a great question. Um, so I think that the most important things to ask about, um, one, I do think asking about your genetic markers is important. I think it gives you a little bit of an idea as to why your doctor is seeing you at a particular frequency. Um, and gives you a little bit more understanding about your CLL itself. I think talking with your doctor specifically about um, how immunocompromised you are at the time of diagnosis and, and talking about infections um, sort of along your journey is, is also incredibly important. And then I think making sure that you and your doctor are actively talking about your routine healthcare maintenance, vaccinations, 
routine cancer screenings is also incredibly important. So those are the, those are the big things. And I think making sure that your doctor understands where you are sort of uh, mentally in your journey with CLL and where your anxiety level is, is also very important. Um, part of what I see my job as um, is also to try and help either find resources to help with anxiety or see what we can do in the office to maybe help alleviate some of the anxiety that goes around office visits and, and the diagnosis of CLL. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, what exactly defines a CLL world expert and why is it so important for CLL and SLL patients to consult with one? An outstanding question. Um, so there are doctors that see all types of blood cancers. And then there are a, sub, a select few doctors that just see CLL. So I, th I think about it, Corona, like if you, if you do one thing over and over again, like Malcolm Gladwell says, you become an expert. So if all day, every day, all you are doing is reading about CLL, doing research on CLL, seeing CLL patients, you will have more knowledge than somebody who only sees a couple of CLL patients a year. And that's not saying that that doctor is a, a bad doctor. It's just saying that they don't have the same sort of clinical and research experience as someone who really has, you know, written the guidelines for CLL, you know, really does this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when you're looking for a CLL expert, I know the CLL Society has a, a great comprehensive list state by state on their website. So that would probably be where I would start if I was a CLL patient um, and looking to talk with an expert. Great, thank you. Um, uh, what determines, um, a, can you describe a little bit about um, disease staging and what determines disease staging? Absolutely. Um, so I have the pleasure of having gotten to work with one of the, uh, with Dr. Rye, who has the, the Rye staging, and then we also have Binet staging. These classification systems were created in, this, in the 1960s, 1970s. So again, historical, uh, historical context, I think, is important. And at the time, the way that these were, what these were used for were to try and understand why, when we met certain CLL patients, some people live longer than others. And really what that was, and what I think it is, is that it's just showing us where in your, in sort of the natural history of the disease you are, you are when you present. Um, I still think rise staging is important. Um, I put it in all of my notes um, every, you know, for every one of my CLL patients. Um, but staging, basically, we have rise stage zero, and I, I talk about rise staging because it's what's used most commonly in the United States. Um, we have rise stage zero, which is you, all we're really seeing is in the elevated lymphocyte count, the lymphocytosis. Stage one means that we see lymphocytosis and I can prob and I can palpate a lymph node somewhere, or maybe you showed me a lymph node that you palpated before in between our visits. Stage two means that I can feel that your spleen, which is on the left side of your abdomen, is a little bit, in is enlarged. Um, normally we can't feel your spleen when we when we press on your abdomen, we do, when we do an exam, but that's in many CLL patients, we can actually see that uh, the spleen enlarge over time. Rise stage three has to do with whether or not you've developed a low, a lower red blood cell count or any anemia. Um, and again, that can sometimes, depending on where you are, be an indication for treatment. Um, and stage four is developing thrombocytopenia or low platelet count. And again, that can, for some patients, is their indication to start treatment. I give the caveat that, not, that there are patients that develop autoimmune side effects from their CLL, something called ITP and something called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. There are other autoimmune complications of CLL, but these are the two most common. And if you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia, that doesn't necessarily make you a rise stage three. Um, it just means that there's a, a sort of additional thing with your CLL that we need to deal with and treat. Um, and even with those autoimmune complications, we don't necessarily have to treat the underlying CLL right away. Does the uh, staging correlate with severity? So if you're stage four, does that mean you're, you know, is it like having stage four solid tumor cancer, because I think that can be confusing for people. Absolutely. This is, this is very confusing. I think in, in all blood cancers is that the staging that we talk about is so different 
in our, in our blood cancers compared to solid, solid cancers. So the first thing I always say is that just because you have a stage for anything in, a, in CLL doesn't mean that this is not, that this would be treated any differently the way that when we talk about a stage four breast cancer or a stage four colon cancer or a stage four pancreatic cancer, that really does change, you know, not only the, the survival, but really the options for treatment. Um, a stage four CLL means that you, that your CLL might be at a point where you probably need to think about doing some treatment. Um, but that again is, it's an individualized decision uh, to be made with you and your doctor, but based off of the guidelines, when your platelets drop below a hundred, and that is also what rise stage, rise stage four CLL is, that would be a time where we would start to talk about considering treat, starting to treat. So it doesn't necessarily correlate with severity? I think it just means, it doesn't necessarily correlate with severity, I would say. I think it really just tells us where you are in the process of, of, of needing treatment. Um, it used to be that this would, that this told us a little bit about severity, but again, the, the treatments for CLL in the 1960s and 1970s were, were not wonderful. They're very minimal drugs that we could use. And so now you know, we've looked at this previously and rise staging doesn't really predict, you know, how, how long you're going to live with CLL the same way anymore with our newer treatments. Great. Thank you. Uh, someone in watching weight would like to know how you distinguish between CLL induced fatigue and normal tiredness, especially Ooh. for patients who are older. So how do you make that distinction? That is a, a that is the million dollar question. Um, I think it's really challenging. Um, I find that it's something that I can, I start to, as I, I get to know someone over time, if I notice that their fatigue is worsening and maybe I'm seeing something in their blood counts that perhaps it is more CLL related. Um, one of the things that I always try and do is to rule out other causes of fatigue. Um, so often patients, so I always check patients' hormone levels. So things like thyroid, we're already looking to see if you have a, any type of anemia or low red blood cell count. Um, I think sleep apnea is probably underdiagnosed. And so that's one of the other things that I will often send patients for um, are sleep studies to look to see if there is any undiagnosed um, obstructive sleep apnea, because oftentimes if there is, people feel like a, a whole new human being when that's treated. Um, I also do think that fatigue is probably one of those symptoms that because we don't understand it outside of CLL very well, understanding it within the CL, understanding it within CLL is also a little bit more challenging. Um, and I think one of the things, it is a question that I always ask every patient and one that you just, I kind of track over time. Um, it's a challenging one, unfortunately, to start treatment for because there are so many things that can make you fatigued like normal aging, um, other medical conditions. And so usually I try and figure out, tease that out a little bit at each visit. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna go back again to staging for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, does, if somebody's at stage zero and then if they progress to stage one or two, is there a certain predictable time frame over which that would happen? There isn't. And I think that that's sort of where some of these markers come into play. So things like the IGHV mutation, um, which we do check. Um, we know um, that patients that are IGHV mutated progress, their CLL progresses more slowly than those that are IGHV unmutated. It doesn't change our management up front, but it is something that kind of gives us an idea of, of how the disease may progress over time. Um, and it's the same thing with some of those genetic markers that we mentioned, things like deletion 17P. Um, we know that patients with deletion 17P can have a more aggressive, CL a more aggressive course for their CLL um, and perhaps don't re respond better to our newer treatments than they did to chemotherapy, but their response rates are shorter. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily, and, and sometimes if you have a deletion 17P, we, um, may want to think about doing, uh, there's a clinical trial now looking at early intervention for high-risk patients. And so that's something that if you have a deletion 17P um, and were recently diagnosed, you can discuss with your doctor as well. Um, this idea that do we, we don't know right now if intervening early is, is useful or makes you live longer, but for some patients, we wonder if it might, if it might be useful. 
Thank you. Um, you know, people uh, who are newly diagnosed are overwhelmed with the all of the technical jargon and the uh, different tests that are performed. So I know you covered this in your presentation, but I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you to, uh, again, explain the difference between flow cytometry and fish testing, mm -hmm. and can the results of one or both tests change over time? Absolutely. So the flow cytometry, so the, the tests are, are done completely differently. So I'll kind of describe it as best as I can. Um, basically for flow cytometry, we take a sample of your blood and we put it in a machine and it, and we basically shoot light at it and it's, <laughs> we shoot light at it and it scatters in specific ways, um, with certain, uh, other markers on it. And so we basically look at these plots that tell us that we see certain expression of like of something like, C, for example, like CD19, which is a B cell marker. And we're seeing that co-expressing with other markers that are characteristic of CLL. So this is really looking at what's on the outside. Flow cytometry basically looks at what's on the outside of your cells, of these B cells. FISH actually looks like, it looks at what's on the inside of your CLLs, looks at the genetic, at, at the chromosomes themselves. So what's inside the, the genetic material that's inside your cells. Um, the flow cytometry shouldn't change over time. Um, there's a pretty characteristic set of markers that is used for that is diagnostic of CLL. If there are changes, I think it's that that uh, that you notice either in your own flow cytometry going through your reports or that your doctor notices. Um, I think it's an important conversation to have. Fish testing can change over time, um, and it is why that we rec it is why we recommend having the genetic tests, fish, um, and the uh, DNA testing repeated. The other test that doesn't change over time is actually your IGHV mutation status. So that actually um, is something that can be tested once and does not need to be repeated. So yeah, um, I'm going to pick up on the IGHV test. So I think it's... Um confusing for people when they're told that they're mutated and that's actually a better prognostic mm -hmm. result finding than unmutated. So that that's a little counterintuitive. Can you, it, and I know that gets a little very complicated, but maybe you can just give a touch on that briefly, what that really means. Absolutely. It's actually when I teach our, our fellows this, I say, this is the one time having a mutation in, in, in oncology is, is, you know, potentially a good thing. Basically what happens is that you know, as, as our B cells learn how to become B cells, so they start off in their, you know, like baby B cells, and they, they pick up more knowledge along the way, um, there are different things which happen that get them from this immature or young B cell to a mature B cell that's able to do its job, which is to make antibodies. The, muta the muta IGHV mutation basically happens at a later stage. And so what it means is that the CLL clone that we're seeing is probably a little bit more mature um, along the sort of continuum of, of B cell development, kind of like, kind of like your kids, um, you know, the, the, you know, you, you have your kids, they're, in, you know, they're babies and they're infants and toddlers and, and grade school, high school, college, you know, our B cells grow up and it's not the exact same way, but kind of similar idea and that they, and how they gain knowledge and, and can kind of become sort of independent antibody makers. Um, so the IGHV mutation tells us that the, the when, when your CLL cell, when your lymphocyte picked up a mutation to make too many of itself and become CLL, it happened at a later stage in development versus an earlier stage. Um, and the, the clinical implication of that is probably means that these earlier cells are a little bit more easily influenced by some other outside, uh, outside stimuli to kind of perhaps make more of themselves more quickly. I, I hope that that made sense. <laughs> I wonder if the language might evolve at some point to drop mutated and unmutated and substitute mature and immature. I think because we have an actual mutation marker, um, it will probably stay that way. Historically, there were other markers that correlated with this as well. Um, so when you look at some papers, you'll see things like CD38 and ZAP70 methylation. Um, these were all tests that also 
basic that mostly correlated with this IGHV mutation um, testing that we're now able to do commercially very easily. Whereas, you know, in the early 1990s, it was a much harder thing to do this type of testing in a routine clinical setting. So we've had sort of these surrogates that kind of gave us an idea if that was there. Thank you. Uh, again, I know you touched on this in your presentation, um, but it's a question that comes up frequently. When exactly is a bone marrow biopsy warranted? Because many people still get it at the time of their diagnosis, and it turns out that it wasn't necessary. So when is it necessary? So I think that uh, a bone marrow biopsy is necessary if there is some abnormality in your blood count that I can explain by looking at at blood tests. So looking at lab values specifically, sometimes you can develop an anemia, uh, anemia, low red blood cell count. And I'm not really sure if it's related to CLL or not. And I want to make sure that there's no other process going on and doing a bone marrow biopsy is helpful in that scenario. Similarly, I've seen that also, I've done that also for a thrombocytopenia or low platelet counts that I can't quite explain um, just on the basis of a CLL diagnosis of itself. Um, okay, great. Um, I don't routinely do them at diagnosis unless there's something like very abnormal in the CBC. Uh, how are prognostic markers, you know, from the FISH test, how are they used to inform the various treatment options that have become available? Absolutely. This is a, an outstanding question and, and one that can get a little bit complicated. Um, we have wonderful treatment options in the frontline setting now. We have, you know, chemotherapy free, uh, you know, pill and antibody combinations that are given for fixed duration for one year. We have other pills um, that are given kind of continuously, almost like your blood pressure, almost like a blood pressure medication. Um, and some of the prognostic markers like deletion 17P um, will push me towards potentially offering you one versus the other. Um, the prognostic markers also are helpful in sort of me being able to counsel you on how well and for how long I think that you have the potential to respond to some of these various treatments. Um, and, and, they, and I think that that's a, an important thing to know, particularly for some of these fixed duration regimens, is that if you're going to be on something for a short period of time, how long can I predict how long you might be off of treatment and what your treatment free period may be before we maybe need to deal with your CLL again? Thank you. Um, I remember when I was diagnosed a long time ago, now nine years ago, mm -hmm. I was hoping that I'd be one of those people that would never require treatment because I didn't really have any of the terrible uh, or more uh, ominous markers. Mm -hmm. um, that was not the case. So I was curious when somebody asked a question, is it true that upwards of 30% of people diagnosed with CLL never require treatment? Is that, is that still true? I think that that number is probably, it is an old number. It's one that we all hold on to very dearly. Um, it is a number that I believe came about from some research in the 1980s. And my guess is that that number is probably still relatively accurate when I think about my own patient panel, um, that about a third of my patients, you know, can pass away from other things and never have been treated for their CLL. Um, I think um, I had seen in the chat that someone had asked, is that are all those patients just older when they are diagnosed? So like they don't, they weren't going to live as, you know, have as many years with CLL. Um, and it is true that if I have a patient that's diagnosed, you know, at age 80, that the likelihood that they might need treatment is probably a little bit lower than a patient that is diagnosed at age 40. Um, and that is, a, I think, an important conversation to have with your doctor is sort of what are what does my treatment plan potentially look like long-term and should I be expecting to need treatment at some point or another? Um, my longest patient that has not needed treatment is 23 years and running. Uh, well, that segues into a question that came up in the chat box. Um, how much of an impact does age of diagnosis have on, on the survival rate? And does being diagnosed in your 30s and not your 70s uh, make for a different rate of survival? I think this is a great question. Um, I actually don't think that we have the data currently to answer that. 
I would say 20 years ago when our treatments were mostly chemotherapy based, um, that if you were diagnosed at 30 and needed treatment relatively quickly, that I do think that probably your lifespan would have been shortened. Um, now with our newer agents, um, and how we, and, and more newer, more new agents coming out in the future, I'm not sure what that is going to look like, um, with how we are sequencing treatments. Um, usually though, I would say for someone who's in their thirties, who is diagnosed, um, that's someone that I, I usually say like, you'll probably need treatment in the future, but when that is, I don't know, because if that person is needs treatment at 23 years, they're only 53, <coughs> which I think is personally quite young. Um, related to that, um, how much more do we know about the cause of CLL and how close might we be to finding a cure for it? So there's still a lot of active research going into how CLL develops. Um, and some of that really is starting to be done. Uh, we are actually working on this in at Northwell and in our and with our lab colleagues um, and Dr. Nick Chirazi's lab, trying to even understand how patients who have MBL uh, go on to develop CLL. Um, we know that MBL is a precursor to CLL. Most CLL patients probably have had that before they were diagnosed, whether they knew it or not. Um, and what are sort of the steps that, that happen that for patients go from MBL or monoclonal B lymphocytosis to CLL is, is unknown. And I think that that's important because not every person that has MBL goes on to develop CLL. And so I think understanding whatever genetic or environmental factors are associated with that is, is of importance in understanding how CLL develops. Um, so that's something that's currently under study that we just don't know, although I wish we did and I, and I hope we do, because then I think we can develop better early intervention strategies and potentially could prevent CLL from, from developing in patients who are high risk for that. Um, in terms of finding a cure, I think we've made great leaps and bounds in the last decade in terms of just treatment and outcomes. Um, the question I think will be is with our newer agents and, and newer technologies that are coming out, how do we combine these optimally for different patients in order to produce the deepest responses that we think might be get us as close to cure as possible? Um, the only thing currently that we have right now in our arm, in our armamentarium that is curative is uh, is a, is a, a stem cell transplant, a, an unreal or an allogeneic stem cell transplant. The challenge with that is that it is a big procedure. There's a hospitalization, and there's about a 10 to 20 percent, depending on which data you look at, risk of of death from complications of the transplant itself. Um, and so that's probably not what we should be doing for everyone. There's also sort of an upper age limit into the seventies of when, you know, transplant is safe. And when you have a disease where the median age of diagnosis is 70 years and not everybody needs treatment, it really is a few number of people who I think allogeneic stem cell transplant is going to be something that they are considered for, um, so I, I think we're inching towards a cure. I, I, I want one just as much as everybody else does. I want to be put out of business. Well, let's hope that soon. Um, <coughs> uh, when are PET scans warranted? Great question. Um, so at time of diagnosis, I in general am not doing a lot of scans right away unless I'm feeling some very large bulky lymph nodes or an enlarged spleen. I generally use PET scans when patients tell me that they're having a lot of weight loss, constitutional symptoms, uh, fevers, chills, night sweats are, is sort of the line. Um, and when that happens, that's usually when I, that's my trigger to order a PET scan. Um, I, in general, don't do it right at diagnosis, particularly for patients that are relatively asymptomatic because I don't think it changes very much or adds very much to sort of the, the treatment plan. Um, but to me, the utility of a PET scan is most important in ensuring that there's no other process going on that's perhaps a little bit more aggressive um, than CLL. For patients who are in watch and wait or active surveillance, uh, approximately how often should they be seeing their doctor? I have a tendency to see patients every three to six months. Um, usually for the first year, I see patients every three months to get a sense of what their blood counts are doing, whether or not things are relatively stable, 
whether or not we are seeing, you know, some dynamic changes in the blood counts. Um, and then after that, you know, if patients are, 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 the CDC isn't changing very much and people, you know, are relatively asymptomatic, I'll usually go out to six months, uh, very rarely once a year. Does that hold true for patients who are post-treatment and are patients who are post-treatment essentially back as active surveillance patients? They kind of are, you know, I, my treat, my patients that are post-treatment, I usually see every three to six months um, because I am looking to make sure that the CLL doesn't come back a little, come back quickly. Um, Cause that very rarely can happen with some of our newer treatments. Um, but in general, I don't go much longer than six months without seeing a patient. Can you explain again uh, why it's important to have a dermatologist on your team and how often should you be seeing the dermatologist for routine skin checks? Absolutely. Um, so we do know that the most common other kind of cancer that patients with CLL can have are non-melanoma skin cancers. These are relative, so things like basal and squamous cell carcinomas, these are things that are very easy to remove. Um, but if you don't actually remove them, they can get bigger and can actually become destructive to local area, local areas. Um, and basal cell carcinomas that are left sort of untreated can actually become very disfiguring. Um, so the way that I look at this is that if it's, if we can do like a quick little biopsy and remove it and have it not have a cosmetic, uh, is, have no cosmetic issues, then that is worthwhile. I, in general, recommend at least once a year, um, dermatologists will be able to, to better tailor this to what your needs are based off of whether or not you've had multiple squamous or basal cell cancers removed or any other types of abnormalities. Are the, are the presence of moles an additional risk factor? I do not believe that they are. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm gonna uh, go to like an, the next group of questions on vaccines. Um, I know you, you addressed this briefly, but since COVID is still on everyone's mind, um, and I know the guidance for getting a second bivalent dose hasn't been established or has it? Uh, the last time I checked, this has not yet been established um, in the United States. I know several other countries are using, are getting second bivalent boosters. Um, we're still waiting for more guidance from the FDA and the CDC on this. Um, I think if you are able to get a second bivalent, there's probably very little downside, but in my experience, my patients who have tried to have not been able to um, because it's not part of the guidance currently. Thank you. Uh, someone asked a question about, can you explain the risks and benefits of someone with CLL getting the shingles vaccine? I know you touched on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to add something. Um, when I was on treatment and now in remission, mm -hmm. I'm on a maintenance dose of acyclovir, yes. uh, which is also to prevent shingles. Um, should patients who are in active surveillance, even before they get treatment, should they be, be put on a maintenance uh, of a uh, regimen of acyclovir? Ooh, excellent question. Um, I, in general, don't prescribe acyclovir or valacyclovir for my patients um, until they need treatment, um, but I do put the majority of my patients on treatment on it, to, and the duration sort of depends. Um, I think that shingles is a horrifying and awful disease, um, and it's very painful, so I like to avoid it for my patients at all costs. Um, so Initially, before we had Shingrix, the only vaccine that we had for shingles was Zostavax, and that is a live, a live vaccine. And we do not recommend live vaccines for our patients with CLL. The reason being is that there have been cases of viral reactivation. So this is just a, you know, it's basically we kill off this, we basically turn the virus off, but in, a, in an immune compromised host, the vi these viruses or, or bacteria can sometimes come back to life and then you can get very sick from that. Um, and we have case reports of that happening with certain, with certain live vaccines, which is why we actually do not recommend using them. The Shingrix vaccine actually was tested not just in patients over the age of 50 um, and older patients, but also was specifically tested in patients that had been post-stem cell transplant. 
So I think of them as like our most immunocompromised people. And it actually worked quite well in preventing shingles. Um, so I, I think that this is one of the vaccines where we have data in immunocompromised patients um, that it is effective. And so I do recommend that all of my patients get Shingrix. Um, sometimes it can be a little challenging if you're under the age of 50, but as long as you let, pe- let your primary care or the pharmacy that you're going to go know that you are an immunocompromised person, they should be able to give it to you. Thank you. Um, this is a, a rather patient specific question, but someone wanted to ask, um, is it safe to get the yellow fever vaccine while you're in watch and wait? They, they're planning on a trip to Africa? This is a good question. I've only ever had this one once come up before previously. Um, I would speak specifically with your doctor and potentially with a, um, a travel vaccine specialist about this because I have very limited knowledge and, and experience with the yellow fever vaccine. And so it is a live vaccine. And so I think that, that, that that's something that needs to be addressed um, with your care providers specifically. Um, cause I don't know what the risk would potentially be of reactivation, um, of that and getting yellow fever from the vaccine itself. Thank you. Uh, in the chat box, somebody asks how many infections is a lot. And I, I guess I'll add to that is number and is also severity, but. Ab- absolutely. So for me, um, if you have had, you know, more than three infections in a year and you're having a hard time clearing infections, meaning that we've done a couple courses of antibiotics for a sinus infection or a cough or a bronchitis that you can't get rid of. That to me is when I start to think about doing IVIG for a patient. Um, IVIG is, is amazing. It decreases the rates of infections and hospitalizations. Um, I think that downside of IVIG is that it is it can be either an office visit or someone coming your home to give you an infusion once a month. Um, so it's a, a, conver- a case-by-case basis um, that we talk about it. Some patients want to hold off, um, but that's it. The most common side of common infections that patients with CLL can get are upper respiratory tract infections. Um, usually they're viral and can then sometimes turn bacterial. So that, that's, those are the infections that I think IVIG is, is incredibly helpful for Preventing. What is the current availability for uh, IVIG? I know the supply can vary over time. I have not heard anything recently, knock on wood, um, that, there, that there are any shortages currently, um, but it is something definitely to keep an eye out for. Uh, someone asks, when you say, quote, routine cancer screening, unquote, are you talking, oh, well, hold on, my screen just jumped without my permission. Uh, that wasn't nice. I think they wanted to know about um, if they if they were talking about uh, other types of being screened for specific types of cancer. But the question just leaped away from me. Absolutely. Um, so I think the the cancers that we routinely screen for are breast cancer, cervical cancer, skin cancers, colon cancer, and prostate cancer are the ones that we have and lung cancer as well, um, that we have pretty routine screening guidelines for. Um, In terms of, is there something extra that we should be doing for our CLL patients to screen? Right now, we don't have data that tells us we should be doing any extra imaging or other testing outside of that. I do think it's a good question. It's something that needs, that we need to study a little bit more um, to understand if perhaps our preventative healthcare guidelines for patients who don't have CLL um, aren't adequate enough or enough for our patients that do have CLL. I don't know if we really have that data yet to say that, you know, everyone should get a total body MRI every couple of years. Um, Sticking with that line of questioning, someone asks, I'm presently having colonoscopies every five years. Should I have them more frequently? I don't think so. Um, In general, I leave it up to the GI doctors based off of what they've seen. Obviously, a colonoscopy is a procedure, and so procedures do come with risks, and they do have anesthesia. Um, So if you have a clean colonoscopy, um, usually they'll say five to 10 years. They'll give you like a five to 10-year window. I usually tell my patients to sit to be a little bit more conservative um, and do around every five, five years or so. 
Uh, here's a, a, a slightly different question. Someone asks, I'm currently taking Imbruvica and it is very expensive. Are there any less expensive drugs coming in the near future for CLL treatment? Uh, financial toxicity is a huge problem now that we have these drugs that work really well, but as you said, are horrifyingly expensive. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to fix the prescription drug co-payment issue as quickly as we need to. Um, and I don't know right now, all of the alternatives to Imbruvica are around the same amount of money. Um, I think that, you know, where, where we go with this is, is a little bit challenging as a, as a healthcare community, not just for obviously our drugs for CLL, but in general. And so I think we, this is something that that definitely needs to be addressed. And, and I am sorry that Imbruvica is so expensive. Uh, what are your guidelines for your patients uh, in active surveillance um, about wearing masks um, in, in the cur current COVID climate? And what type of masks? Excellent question. I have been telling my patients to continue to, to wear masks when they're in crowded public places. Um, and I have also been kind of tailoring everyone's you know, what everyone's com comfort level is with COVID and potentially getting a COVID infection, is, I think is a is sort of something to talk with your doctor on a case by case basis. Um, but for patients that are flying, I always ask them to please, you know, wear a mask N95 if they can tolerate it, if they can't, at least, you know, a, a regular surgical mask. Um, and then same thing for, for crowded spaces. Uh, indoor dining comes up a lot. And I think that that's something to talk with your doctor on a case by case basis about. Uh, I'm seeing a couple of questions from women in the chat box and we're asking about um, how often they should get PAP tests. And one uh, a participant asks, how does going through menopause affect CLL, if at all? I don't think we have a good understanding of how menopause affects CLL. Um, obviously, CLL is more common in men, so it is so it sort of, and I think a lot of the studies that we have in clinical trials are often, there are more men than women enrolled. Um, so I, I don't think that we have a clear sense um, of how menopause affects CLL. Um, but that's an, an excellent question and one that I'm gonna have to go back and think a little bit about more so that way we can come up with some better answers for how to study it. Um, another question, and I'm just reading it uh, fresh here, and it may be beyond the scope of today's presentation, but someone asks, is there a benefit for someone to enter into a CAR T cell trial if their medication is controlling their CLL? Ooh, that is a hard question. Um, so CAR T cell therapy is very exciting. Um, obviously, um, you know, the first case, the first time CAR T cells were used were in patients with CLL at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, two out of the three patients on that trial are in remission. I, I think we're now 10 to 11 years later. Um, and these are patients that had gotten a lot of chemotherapy and had highly refractory disease. Um, I think that that is a good question, but one that I'm going to have to say, you'll have to speak specifically with your doctor just because I don't have enough specifics to give, I think, good advice. Someone asked uh, I, I, a great question. Um, the question is, since most CLO patients are elderly, 70s and up, how do many tolerate the treatments? And I would guess, you know, treatment tolerance is a cause of concern regardless of age. Um, Absolutely. No, I think that this is also a really good question. Uh, so my the oldest patient that I have on treatment right now um, is 93, um, and they are doing quite well um, and tolerating their treatment well. I think one of we have some data on this from um, a drug a drug trial looking at um, idolalisib treatment, which is a PI3K inhibitor that we don't really use very often in CLL anymore, um, but is an important drug still. And one of the most important things I think for CLL patients that need treatment is that when we treat your CLL, we improve your symptoms and you often feel better. And that's, that's important. Side effects occur. Um, and I can't ever really, we don't really have a great, great way of predicting who's going to have side effects to which medications and how they'll tolerate drug. 
Um, the B, the BTK inhibitors, I think are probably the most common drug that I write for patients, um, in their older and who are more elderly. Um, and overall, I think that they've been pretty well tolerated. Uh, somebody asks a good question. Is it normal to be diagnosed with both CLL and SLL? And, uh, that will be our last question. Yes, it's totally normal. Um, so CLL, like we talked about before, that's sort of like a continuum. So you have CLL on one side and SLL on the other. Um, and there are some people that just have an elevated white blood cell count and you know never develop lymph nodes or big spleen. Um, and there are some people that have ele- uh, enlarged lymph nodes and a big spleen, but never really develop you know a high white blood cell count or a circulating you know what we call lymphocytosis, that elevated lymphocyte count. The majority of people though kind of live in that continuum, right? So the majority of people probably have some combination of both. Maybe somebody has a higher white count and smaller lymph nodes. Somebody has an elevated white count, but their lymph nodes are really big and that's become their major issue that requires them to need treatment. Um, But they are continuums of the same disease. Great. Um, So Dr. Rhodes, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? Yes. So one, thank you all for your attention and for the outstanding questions. They got me thinking, and now I know what a couple of my next research projects are going to be. So thank you all for the, for the ideas. I think the most important thing as a newly diagnosed CLL patient is to educate yourself and then to be your, your, be your own advocate. Um, The healthcare system can be challenging to maneuver. And I think having a lot of tools and support at your fingertips is so important in order to ensure that you're getting the best care possible. Thank and you. never and be afraid course, to ask for a second opinion. And and join a support group. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate uh, Dr. Rhodes' participation. That was fantastic. And once again, we'd like to thank our generous donors and grant support from uh, Beijing for making this event possible. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to Dr. John, uh, Joanna Rhodes again for her presentation. Uh, We would greatly appreciate if you would please complete our event survey and provide your feedback to help us plan for future events. This virtual event was recorded and will be available on our website. Again, if your question was not answered and we had so many that weren't, please send your question to asktheexpert at clllsociety.org. You see it up there on the screen. Our next webinar, Understanding how biomarkers help guide treatment decisions for those with CLL and SLL will be on uh, Monday, May 22nd, and we hope you can join us for that. And please remember, the CLL Society is invested in your long life, and you can invest in the long life of CLL Society by supporting our work. Together, we can improve the lives of those with CLL, SLL. Thank you so much, and take care, everybody.